Popcorn Junkies. Popcorn Junkies, hi. Here's another review that we're just trying to get in beneath the line, over the line, before the bell. Before the, fat, the line. before the fat cow sings? No, that's awful. Yeah, before, before the, the... Yes, exactly. Something like that. Anyway, okay, welcome to the Popcorn Junkies, guys. If you haven't, do subscribe. Over the next year, lots of films will be landing. Lots of reviews will be landing. Trailer reactions. The Weekly Rushes is coming back. A one-stop shop for all your movie madness is here. Um, and so we are now reviewing a film called May... December, or as, as you, Mum, you texted me last night and said, when are we going to do May, October? Do you know what? Do you know where it comes from, the phrase? No, no, tell me. It's uh, apparently, it's it used, I don't know who explained this in one of their reviews. I've hardly seen any reviews of this film, but it's usually used to mean an older man with a younger woman. Oh, is it? Yeah, oh. May, May to December or whatever it is. Oh, right. But uh, yeah, I do keep calling it October, oh, right. you're right. So what are the darling buds of May? That's the only other thing I can think of. It all seems to be around May, doesn't it? Spring. And all that. It'll be spring, 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 spring yeah. sort of. Okay, so the director of this is Todd Haynes. Are you a Todd Haynes fan? I think I am. Right. Okay. I, I didn't <laughs> Did like Carol, but then I, I can't work out if my problem with Carol is my problem with Kate Blanchett. <laughs> I wasn't that keen on Carol, but I have liked quite a few of the ones he's done. Right. But he also uses Julianne Moore quite a bit. I that's think. right. That's right. He did that film years ago where she had an awful kind of Safe. allergy. Safe. That's Safe. Right. I, quite, I think I quite enjoyed yeah. that. I seem to remember liking that film. The two main stars in this film were Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman. I'm not entirely certain what I think of Natalie Portman as, a, as an no. actress. Um, you know, she's always workmanlike. She kind of, she's never bad, but she never sort of like gets me really excited. Whereas Julianne Moore has always been an, in, for me, I've, I've always found her a fascinating actress. Anyway, this is the story of a woman of a certain age. It's based, it's loosely based on a true story, isn't it? Yeah, a tabloid, tabloid sort of sensation. It's all real, apparently. You yes. Look it up. Yeah, in terms of a woman, and not entirely dissimilar. So I don't know if you remember the Renata Williams story that we did. You know, an older woman essentially wooing, uh, ensnaring, and having sex with a 12 year old or a 13 year old uh, boy. So, yes, yeah, so it's the story of really, you know, a, a woman essentially abusing and taking advantage of a young, a young boy, um, having sex with him getting pregnant, uh, being charged, going to going to prison, but then after serving her prison time, uh, reuniting with the with her love interest, marrying. She loses the baby in prison, I think. She's a criminal. She's been she's yeah, on the sex yeah, register, you know, yeah. sexual sex offenders register and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But she marries this man, uh, and obviously when we sort of join him them, them in the film, they're that much older, they're a couple, they have children, they have a family, they've forged a life together. Uh, but what kicks it all up again is Natalie Portman coming along to essentially research the story of Julianne Moore's character to to retell it in the form of an indie film. Um, yeah. And, you know, the, the sort of big hump in the road they have to get over there really is convincing us, the viewer, that uh, Julianne Moore's character would have agreed to this <laughs> um, at yeah. all, you know, without thinking this is going to be sensationalist and all, that, all, all the rest of it. Yeah. The, the emphasis for that is all on Julianne Moore's shoulders, isn't it? In that she's got to convince us that she would put up with that because a lot of people would just send the girl packing. From absolutely, the absolutely. Yeah. And I think if, the, if there was any sort of real kind of front end quibble I had with this film, it was the, you know, this film was going to, yeah, this film's going to succeed or not on whether it convinces you that that sort of, uh, relationship would have really been able to be forged because that I don't believe was based on a true story. That's that's the kind of construct within this film, isn't it? So this is so essentially you've got Natalie Portman. She's going to research the, the, this amazing character, Julia Moore. She's going to get delve deep into the nature of their relationship, the the ways in which she wooed this youngster, um, and how they now live a family life. And she's going to translate this into, as I say, it's important to say, a sort of indie film, a thought provoking, intelligent film. Because I think key to Natalie Portman's character is that she's an actress who's well known for some pulp on telly. Yeah, but she wants. Yeah to change her own sort of profile as an actress, doesn't yeah, she? Yeah, I like the complications of it, Mark. And um, I mean, I love beautiful images and all of that. And but but I do like a really good, good, good plot. Mm. And this is a good one. I mean, it's sort of like there's so many strands to it. Don't mm. you think it's complicated? It is complicated. Also, I'm a sucker for doppelgangers. Anything anything where there's a doppelganger yes. type mystery. Yes. I love that. And quite quickly, there was something about it that wasn't working for me, but then there was something about it that was working for me. And I think the thing yeah. that was working for me was the strength of the, actually the two performances at the heart of it and the oscillating energy between the two of them. I, exactly. I, whatever you think of both actresses, I think there is, there's a third aspect to this, which is that frisson between the two of them and, and that reflective relationship, you say that doppelganger-esque thing that kind of creeps in. I mean, the interesting thing about any good actor, and this, this film speaks to the process, if you like, of method acting, researching yeah. a role, 
getting to the truth of a role. You know that great quote that John Hurt trotted out saying, you know, everyone says yeah. actors are involved in lying. Actually, actors... That's why I knew you'd be really interested in it, because I saw it before, Mark, that you'd be interested in that aspect, yeah. if nothing else. But yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, he, and he goes on about that, that thing that he says, where actors are actually interested in truth. Yes, it's a fictionalised truth, but they're interested in getting to the truth of the emotions in order to represent it in a fiction. And I think, in that sense, you're right, this film is much more than just what it appears to be upon a first sort of, you know, glimpse. Well, what's clever, I think, and it's sort of an awful lot of it I felt while I was watching it but even more I felt when I was thinking about it afterwards he's clever this director he was sort of when I thought about it afterwards I thought he drops in little pieces of information that until you think about it afterwards I mean for example the the boy who is now a man he's mm. 36 when we join the sort of party mm. um seems to be fine with all this he sort of seems to be have absorbed it obviously he'll have had things going on in his mind but he's absorbed it they're part of the community and he seems of everyone to be okay mm. and then it's that we're only given sort of very very slight in, in indications that he might not be mm. They seem to be, as a couple, well absorbed into the community. Mm. And it's an idyllic community, the sun shining and they have pool parties and it's mm. all sorts of wonderful. But then there are two things. One is that we're given, she's Ica, Julia Moore, and we're given sort of slight information that people buying her stuff might not be buying it because they think it's good, but because they feel sorry for her. Um, there's, there's a tiny bits of information. Oh, and the fact that she has these sort of, not many, considering what's happened but she has these crying jags where she just sort of deeply deep d distress mm. but then she's okay you see I, I, yeah I, I mean i thought what's interesting about that was because when we were first talking about it I, I this is a film about trauma uh and yeah. it's a film about how um you can not even be aware that trauma has happened because of the narrative that's promoted to the outside world. And I think, again, as you rightly say, this works on two different le levels of this film. There's the narrative of, of the young boy who's, who's now a grown man and who's married to Julianne Moore, who, for whom this is now normal. And so the, but the normality of what their life is, that's the ultimate sort of accomplishment, if you like, of grooming, is that he's had no ability to take a perspective on his life until Natalie Portman comes in to look at it as a thing um, you know, there's no sense, f you know, for him of having really had to explore this or he's been able to turn away from it or Julianne Moore's been able to curate their lives in such a way that he never has to sort of feel what's what's happened there because he's so still so in her orbit. And I think yeah. what, 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 what I was, I found almost alienating about the film and didn't like stylistically, which is things like the soundtrack and that sort of sepia toned, almost, it was almost like a Timothée advert all the way through, yeah, wasn't it? it was. It's it was. almost like he'd sort of literally oiled the lenses or put, you know, put a gauze of a kind of nylon or tights or something over the lens. So it had that 1950s kind of feel to the lens work. Um, it, it kind of, it shrouded it in a sort of nostalgic ambivalence and a, a potential to see it as all as you say perfect and sun soaked and it's a beautiful neighborhood but seething beneath it were, was deep deep trauma and and the fact yeah. that this man had been not only groomed as a child into having sex but groomed across his entire life into yeah. accepting this marriage and this lifestyle it's really interesting actually hearing you make that sort of analysis because you use the word and this word had honestly not occurred to me at all while watching it or until I was speaking to you of grooming right and when as soon as you say that I've stopped short and sort of I'm shocked because that's what we just never think of can happen right I mean as well as the actual initial sexual mm. Mm. you know whatever but you never ever can can put grooming with a with a woman that's what a woman's doing and when you said that I thought about it afterwards we, we'd had a conversation and I thought that is what she's doing she's grooming every day mm. in that respect isn't she mm. and and it's only when he has his own sorts of turnaround that you, you realise that. I mean, I think one of the problems I had with it in terms of believability, and I do think these things kind of matter, I think Julianne Moore sold to me why, you know, her her sort of, I thought she was incredibly mesmerising, that her desire to kind of almost, you know, cor it didn't feel like she was wanting to correct a wrong narrative even. I think she just really wanted to reveal that she was a, a nice person or a good yeah. person or a yeah. you know not or, or or at the very least not an evil person so no. i kind of bought into her what i struggled a little bit with was the extent to which the kids accepted the set setup or situation with their parents you know what were their thoughts on it and because because of course the other detail is julian Moore was married before so she had previous children older children from a yeah. previous marriage and, yeah. and so natalie portman goes through this process of interviewing people from julian Moore's life doesn't she sort of to get she to get a better understanding first husband, doesn't she? exactly yeah. and again at that point you sort of 
they did quite a good job there because I thought, no, this would be the point Julianne Moore would start to put the, the brakes on this and start to say, hang yeah. on a minute, he's delving too deep. And, they, and yeah. they tackle it, she says it, and she gets a bit more caustic and cold with Natalie Portman, doesn't she? Yeah. But, but yeah. she still keeps proceeding with it, which I quite liked because it was almost like her burning desire to correct a perceived wrong of her was more overwhelming than the yeah. dis discomfort of what she was going through. Well, yeah, that's what I found ultimately in the, in the film, with, of which many things fascinated me. That was the thing that fascinated me the most, was right. the way she stuck to her guns, Julianne Moore, in that she, you felt, she felt she'd done nothing wrong, except for these moments of absolute, you know, just distress when mm. she cries, 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 cries. And, um, but, but other than that, she's absolutely sort of fixed in her thing of a, of a pillar of the community almost. Mm. There's tension with the kids, isn't there? I felt yes. like a real crackle of tension at yes. the dinner table and that. Yeah. And I suppose that that's, that's been happening all, all the time. I thought there was that but, incredibly um, emotional moment between, you know, Julianne Moore's partner, who was the child that she's now married, between yeah. him and their son on the rooftop when they had a spliff together. I thought that was a very, that's right, yes. I thought yes. that was a very powerful scene because on the one hand, it, it, because he hadn't ever smoked spliff and his child had, his son was there rolling a spliff and he was like, I haven't had any. And he said, you've not had any. That was a really very, I thought it was a really neat, subtle, clever way of showing how the grown man had had so many parts of the normal journey of being a child disallowed him in a sense, you yeah, know, because of this yeah. grooming, because of his curious relationship with Julianne Moore, that his son was having a more normal existence than even yeah. he had and that he was more the infant in that moment yes. than, than yes, the son. True. And also it sort of opens up stuff for him, doesn't the... Um... I mean, I mean, when I, I've only seen it once, but I've thought about it a lot. But I sort of thought that the boy, I don't know his name, the man that she marries, the man. So, um, so the character is I Joe Yu, played he, by Charles Melton. I thought he was the weak link. But as I thought about it afterwards, I didn't think he was because I thought it was important that he sort of, he remained constant and stayed in the background until he has his sort of... Um, change, which sort of comes about three quarters of the way through the film, doesn't it? And I thought then... I, th I thought his performance was absolutely magnificent. I, I, I thought, Did you? Were, yeah, because he had a stunned and stunted kind of anaesthesia almost about yeah, his performance, which, word, which for word. me really, really made for me made the grooming aspect or the the long term grooming aspect of this really believable, and and I found his evolution really believable, his twist and his turn and his shift towards. The un, you know, so whilst Natalie Portman is kind of, you know, very self-interestedly wanting to get the right role and get the truth of the situation and the truth of Julia Moore, and Julia Moore was wanting to get a perceived truth of herself out to the world that she's a kind of man. Meanwhile, you've still got this victim who I made a note in my notes where he's become the victim again. He's not only been the victim once; he's becoming the vi he becomes a victim of Natalie Portman too, because that yeah, moment true. where he shows her the letter or a letter that he sent her to Julia Moore when he was younger or something, you know, she and there was that moment where Natalie Portman refers to him as a story rather than what he's been through and so he's been yeah. in one sense he's been taken advantage of by julianne moore and then he's been taken advantage of yet again in the process of, of natalie portman trying to construct this True. story and so True. his and his evolution i didn't think we needed all that chrysalis moth stuff for the you know the, the clear metaphor there is you know as he's being built oh, reborn yeah. oh, even that you know and being yeah, trapped yeah. and being sort of incubated and all that kind of stuff i mean yeah i like the shots but i i didn't i didn't necessarily need it so much but i i thought he was I thought he was a tra truly tragic character. Yeah, he was. Yeah, and I sort of, I, I did only see it the once, but because I'd felt that the first time I saw it, I really had to interrogate my feelings on that. And mm. I, I decided that he wasn't the weak link at all. Right, And right. that it was important that he remain sort of stoic, if you like, stoic. Mm. He'd taken up a position on it, or maybe not allowed himself to think of it. Yeah, no, I agree, point. I agree. And what did you think of its sort of dreamy nostalgia? I mean, obviously he made, uh, Todd Haynes was making a lot of reflections and mirrors and lots of depth of focus shots. So you'd have one character in the foreground and a reflection of them again in the background and lots of usage of double reflections and mirrors and, you know, lots of parallel shots of the two of them. A very powerful scene, I thought, when uh, Julianne Moore was showing her how to apply her makeup and then was yeah. applying, I was getting, it was very powerful stuff, that. Yeah, I mean, he was playing, I mean, he was playing a dangerous game there, Todd Haynes, because that could have gone totally wrong. It was so sort of in your face, this sort of thing of I'm imitating this woman or am I imitating this woman? Well, full but credit to the, full credit to the actresses. I mean, they, they really... Oh, I... yeah. And the actresses, yeah. The Natalie Portman character had less to do, one could say, mm. but um, in that she was mimicking Julianne Moore. Or she, I mean, I mean, she did, but she did sort of take on aspects of her personality, didn't she? She changed her voice. She had sex with him. 
no, no, no. I mean, no, no. I mean, talk about Even taking that, taking sorry. method acting to its to its logical conclusion. She, you know, she's so draw. She goes so down the wormhole of method acting. She's reliving, and I saw yeah. that as a as a again that really hammered home. The poor guy is is a story. Well, yeah, but that interesting. You should say that because I did, I didn't buy that. I didn't buy. I, I bought that they kissed or something because it was steamy and it was sort of getting. It was mm. all sort of in the air. But I didn't think they would have had sex. I just don't think the boy, the man, as he is now, would have done that. But it's, it's could, because what it seemed to me then, I thought he lost the ball then, Scott Haynes, because it was sort of like all the barricades, or whatever you would call them, that he'd built up, this man, came falling down and he went for it. And mm. I just don't think he would have done that. Mm. I found that... The, yeah, I think I'm the inclined to scene, agree. The, the last scene where he's looking you know, sort of across at his kids and his wife and everybody did, and he starts to cry. I mean, I thought that was infinitely more powerful. Mm -hmm. um, but I liked what that did f to our perception of Natalie Portman's character. because Oh, I, yeah, no, that's true from her point of view. Yeah, yes, so yes. whilst I agree, it wouldn't not necessarily believable in terms of his character, perhaps, but I thought, wow, yeah, he's really, he, he took us to a really, I think, dark place about method acting. And of course, all of this was kind of made even more, not mysterious, but sort of sinister and kind of, and kind of, I don't know. I found the scene where Natalie Portman was invited to talk at the school or college about acting and doing intimate scenes, sex scenes. And her that interesting thing where she talks about how where is it? Where she talks about how you know sometimes even in the acting of a scene, if you feel something for someone, um, you know, there's, where's the performance and where's the reality? And I thought that you know it's something that I think most of us who are non-performers often ask the question: How can you do something that intimate if you're not feeling something? If if being an actor is about getting to the truth of this, you're going to have to yeah. take yourself to a place of feeling some arousal or something. And I think the way in which she talked about that moment and that scene, I'd be fascinated to know what what intimacy coordinators make of that scene now. You know, was yeah. was that speaking to the idea that even for Natalie Portman? you know, taking advantage of someone else in a fictional scene was okay. There's permitted kind of exploitation yeah. of someone else or a situation. Um, and, and that sort of, for me, then reflected quite heavily on her moment with him. What was she doing there? Was she was this an acting scene that she was acting out with him, well, that moment well, of intimacy? Well, exactly. But as you say, was it, was it an acting scene? It wasn't. So one could say in a way that it was sort of like... It, she did it because she did it because she wanted to see if she could or or also it it by that stage using a doppelganger sort of <laughs> she'd or she'd almost become julianne moore hadn't she so in totally that sense right. she's pushing it to the limit yeah. there was so much complication i love the fact that um the julianne moore character the baking and the way it looked and the uh, you know being in the community and all of that was typical sort of women woman strong women sort of in a community and all their support and everything else and yet at the back of that, and we all know it because of like people stop buying her stuff or whatever, and it's there all the time, except she refuses, Julianne Moore refuses to deal with it. It's like the most heinous crime of all, isn't it? That um, sort of, it's almost like the crime that dare not speak its name. Absolutely. I mean, it's so bad. Yeah. And not only has it happened, they've gone on and produced this family. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, and I, it brought up all sorts of things to me because I thought, how would you feel? You'd feel, say you were the neighbour, You'd feel one thing for the fact that she'd done it and how awful that was, but you wouldn't want to put that onto the children. So you'd have to do when it's incredibly layered. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think it, it was a really interesting film about how an act of grooming then sort of infiltrates and infects the next generation of children. Because, I mean, how, yeah. uh, how on earth do those children square up to the truth of what's happened between, you know, mum and dad? Mum wooed dad when he was a child, basically. I mean, how do you, yeah. how do you come to terms with that? And I thought there was a neat tension between um julianne moore and the children she'd had with her you know young lover i thought that tension yeah. was real you felt that they they had a sort of bristling hostility towards her as their kind of dis you know their their understanding of what had happened became clearer you know um yeah what did you i mean obviously i i had a real i really struggled with the music but you liked the music didn't you i did i mean there's a sort um, of jabbing theme that runs throughout it it's sort of two long sonorous notes isn't it almost like a bell tolling I, I, I mean, it might be, it might be corny, but I, I really, really. It sort of was the final touch for me. Well, it was I thought, interesting I because actually it was really good. Well, because interestingly, but, for, for Nadia and, and people who were in the room and I was watching it, they, it it's. Inc I mean, to, if you haven't watched it, and if, it's incredibly melodramatic. It's obviously meant yeah. to be melodramatic, but it was almost so melodramatic, it, it, it can't help but be corny. But I, I, I did a little bit of digging around into that, and this is interesting detail: is that apparently the the, the sonorous notes or the, the the melody or whatever you would call it are not musical. 
is a reworking of exactly the same notes from the go between the film. Oh, really? They, they took the the composer took the music and reworked it into a sort of heightened version for this. Which, if you then think of the film The Go Between, which is about a young boy falling That's in love with an older woman, yeah, fascinating. And, yeah, yes. I thought that was a really interesting detail, which suddenly made me feel less anti the music, though. To experience yeah, but it, also, it's again, it's his complicated, complicated sort of idea of it. Mm. There, there's, and if you think about it, the go, the go between is a book about a young boy who's infatuated with an old woman, and she, you know, the argument is she sort of leads him on, doesn't she? Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. And then, of course, what in one's head, one always does the thing with that of how far can you be led on if you're a if you're a boy, if you're mm. a male, mm. and mm. and that's why some people refuse to even think that it uh, of it, and other people um, do. I mean, there's a point where Julianne Moore says, and I, I can't remember, does she say this to Natalie Portman? Um, not he asked for it exactly. No, she says it to him, doesn't she? Yes. It was your, I, not it was your idea, but mm. you sort of wanted to do it, mm. as if that is an excuse. As if no, that no, I really felt for him. I, I, I found him, yeah. I found him really heartbreaking. I found him, a, I, thought, I found it a really understated, underplayed, stunned, but not stunted in any way, a stunned performance as it should have been. I, I, I found him really, yeah. really compelling. I was unfair and really, on him, I think, really when, I, when I watched it. Mm. And then again, then Mark, you had the troubling sort of appearance of the guy. The guy I couldn't work out exactly what the relationship of him was. Who says? Um, well, is he not the? Isn't he is one he, of? Is he one of her earlier? Isn't he one of children. her children from a previous marriage? Yeah. So basically, the other, the young, young chick. You're right. I, I got a bit unclear as to whether he was the son of her ex partner from someone else, or whether he was My, actually one of her children. Because he talks about a moment where they jerk each other off or something, doesn't he? As well, which is yeah, a bit strange. Yeah. But he he throws in the details of suggesting that Julianne Moore herself was abused by her brothers. Was that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought that was clever because that then throws you some red meat, in a sense, to potentially excuse or justify what's happened for, to Julianne Moore. And of Julianne course. and Julianne Moore comes it, it, it comes across the fact that he said this to Natalie Portman's character, and then she seeks at the very end. I thought this was a really masterful storytelling stroke because, you, in a weird way, Julianne Moore's character there has been offered the best not justification but yeah. explanation. <laughs> Yeah, as to why what yeah. happened had happened. But she sought to rubbish it. Yeah. And I felt at that moment, I know you didn't feel this, I felt at that moment that the film turned into a moment where Julianne Moore, that was Julianne Moore, and Julianne Moore knew that that was the truth. This is what I read into this. She had been abused. She knew it was the truth. But she knew also that Natalie Portman was frighteningly close to getting a really accurate, challenging portrayal of her onto film. So she thought yeah. she'd do the ultimate thing which would disrupt any actor's pursuit of truth by completely yeah. throwing ambiguity over all of it by saying it's absolutely not true, don't be ridiculous, you know, yeah. I was happy, it never happened. And so that yeah. cut to that shot of Natalie Portman looking distressed was the distress of an actress. Uh, it was also, and also, didn't you feel that was mirrored by our distress as the audience? Because it was sort of like, yes, we're being given a get out at that point. We had been yes. with the boy, with the man saying that, boy man saying that. And then the fact that she trashed it, Julianne Moore trashed it. Yeah, but completely. I didn't believe her. But I didn't believe her. So that no. So. I think I did exactly. But one either takes yeah. up the thing of one does believe her or no. one doesn't. And also, it's not an excuse to do it to do no, what she did. Exactly. We exactly. all know that. But at the same time, we're all human. Yeah. And so in that respect. But I, for me, that me... was the predatory woman in Julianne Moore getting the ultimate revenge on Natalie Portman. And then we get to yes. that final scene, which I thought was again very clever, where Natalie Portman is doing take after take after take and is asking for one more take because she says it's getting more real now and i thought that was clever because what did you think of that yeah tell me as a filmmaker what you actually well made what, I, of that. what i thought was great about that was it, it leaves you it, there, there was no conclusion there and there was no sum up what it left you thinking was what is real here what is real yeah, about yeah. the performance how can natalie portman find the truth here what is the truth if if we now are doubtful of what the truth is what is reality what is truth if this is the story of truth and i think what for me this whole film ended up being about was the tragedy of a of a victim of grooming whose entire life and experience of grooming was now a story for everyone it was a story for julianne moore to have retold of her life it was a story for natalie portman to get right or to get wrong or for it to become more real whereas for him yeah. he was left living it yeah yeah. I, so I think it just, that's it, really yeah. interesting that you say that because in the end it's the very very last scene and and I felt that I, I felt that the most confusing of all because she insists on retake after retake doesn't she because I felt she and couldn't I, get it she couldn't get it I thought she couldn't get to the, the reality no, of it no she, could, she couldn't and it's also a truth that 
it's not the truth as we know about truths. It's her truth, isn't it? And um, exactly. No, really, really. It's very I, clever. I, I mean, I love a film that makes me think deeply, yeah. and that film did. Yeah. So, in sum up and score, go for it. I, I didn't really know anything about it when I went in. I hadn't read anything about it, and it absolutely got me. And and I. I am a big fan of Julianne Moore, and I hope that didn't sort of affect mm. it. Not so much of Natalie Portman, as you say, but I love the way it looked. I love the music because I thought it sort of, it could so easily have been cheesy. And as you say, it bordered on cheesy, mm. but it was sort of like, it was for whom the bell tolls a bit. Mm. I mean, that's mm. pushing it. But uh, I just felt it was so sort of on, on edge, you know, mm. the whole sort of thing. It was so brave mm. in a way. As things stand at the moment, that could be one of my top 10 films. I think I'd give it... 82. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What would you give it? Um, I was really... for sec There was a lot about this that held me at arm's length. And principally, weirdly, it was the filming style. I, I just didn't like it. The music I found discordant and eggy. Um, when you, It's one of those rare occasions where you, where, when you then... But it's a film that hasn't left me. And I've thought oh. lots and lots about it. And I've really found the complications within it from all the perspectives of an actress a, a woman who's done what she's done and the victim of what she's done and also the extended family of that uh, of that family I've, I've just found the implications of what this film is about keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more complicated and more interesting and i think it really does you know without going directly at it it does throw up all sorts of question marks around how Things that we experience in life, trauma, going back to my original thing, which is it's a film about how trauma can be turned into story and how in the telling of story or, or the transference of it into story, trauma can still happen to the people who are real in that storytelling. Yeah. And I thought yeah. there was a really interesting distinction between fiction and storytelling and yeah. what is real life? What is real life? And and right down to, again, it, you know, there were just so many layers to it. Let's go back to the character who's been groomed. You know, he's groomed. What is successful grooming? You believe a story that's been told to you. You yeah. believe yeah. an emotional story that's being sold to you. And you yeah. are in yeah. it and you can't see the, the wood for the tree. I thought it was an incredibly clever film. I thought it was a re really surprising film. It was a, a surprising find at the end of the year. And I really, I really, I really enjoyed it. And I say, I can't, I can't stop thinking about it. I would give it 85 out of 100. Oh, so more or less the same. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, and at full credit to the acting team. I thought they gave it they, they gave it so much nuance. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. There you go, guys. If you see it, tell us what you think, please. <laughs>